Did you know that Nathaniel was martyred in one of the most gruesome ways imaginable? What did Jesus mean by calling Nathaniel a true Israelite? Why did Nathaniel initially express skepticism about Jesus being the Messiah? In this video, we'll go over Nathaniel's character profile, the moment that Jesus called Nathaniel to follow him as a disciple, lessons that we can learn from both Nathaniel and Jesus, his life after Jesus' ascension, and Nathaniel's martyrdom. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Autumn, and I want to change the world through faith-driven and brave conversations. This video is a part of a series I call Disciples of Christ, where I do deep dives on all of the 12 disciples. So if you're interested in that, make sure you like, share, subscribe, hit that notification bell so that you don't miss out on a single story. Class is now in session. Settle down. Get quiet. Mm -hmm. Nathaniel is a Hebrew name meaning gift of God which reflects his religious devotion of his family. He also went by the name of Bartholomew, which means son of Ptolemy or Talmai. This just gives reference to a specific lineage. It was actually pretty common, especially among the disciples to go by two names. One name reflected the familial identity, while the other name reflected their personal identity. There's speculation that the name Ptolemy comes from a royal bloodline. Back in 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 3, Talmai was the name of the king of Geshir, a region that was north of Israel. It is speculation that Nathaniel descended from this royal bloodline. This connection is not definitely proven. These sources are cited outside of scripture. However, it does imply that Nathaniel has ties to an ancient royal bloodline which could have given him a potential high standing among society. This actually correlates with his relation to Philip, who also was speculated to have a high societal standing, given that they knew each other, because Philip was the one that brought Nathaniel to Jesus. It would make sense that Nathaniel also was high standing in society. Nathaniel was specifically identified as being from Cana, which is a region that is not far from Nazareth, the same city that Jesus grew up in. Cana was actually where Jesus performed his miracle um, at the wedding when he turned water into wine. Cana was a modest rural village, likely characterized by their traditional Jewish traditions and tight community. Growing up in Cana, Nathaniel would have been a part of a tight-knit community centered around family, faith, and agricultural work. Nathaniel, like many of the men in the first century, would have grown up steeped in Jewish traditions of his time. Based off the conversations that he had between Philip and Jesus, it shows that he was well-versed in the Torah and the Messianic prophecies. The Bible doesn't really mention anything about Nathaniel's family. We do know that his father's name was most likely Tomai, since his name Bartholomew means son of Tomai. But it doesn't mention if he had any wife or children or any other family members involved. It's most likely that like the other disciples, when he was called by Jesus, he left his livelihood behind. Some positive traits of Nathaniel is that he was honest. He was also skeptical. Nathaniel was initially skeptical about Jesus being the Messiah, especially when he learned that Jesus was from Nazareth. However, once Jesus revealed his true identity and his divine nature, Nathaniel quickly switched and called him the son of God. This shows that although he was skeptical, he was also open to the truth. Nathaniel was also faithful and intellectual. Like I said before, he was well-versed in the scriptures and had a deep understanding of the Messianic prophecies. He had a desire to align his beliefs with scripture, which shows his intellectual rigor. Nathaniel was also humble. Despite his possible royal lineage and his intellectual standing, Nathaniel displayed humility by readily following a teacher from a humble town like Nazareth. So it shows that he's not only open to truth, but he's also open to correction. Now, like everybody else, Nathaniel has some negative traits. First, we have to address his initial prejudice against Jesus. Nathaniel was skeptical of Jesus being the Messiah because Jesus was from Nazareth. This just shows that Nathaniel possibly had a prejudice against people who were from insignificant or humble backgrounds. 
This assumption, though quickly corrected, shows that even righteous people can hold biases based on societal expectations. Nathaniel also displayed cautious skepticism. His cautious and skeptical nature, while largely positive traits to have, might have caused him to miss opportunities of early involvement in Jesus's ministry. His intellectual approach to life may have caused him to be slower to embrace new ideas without clear evidence. This leads me to his final negative trait, which is being overly analytical. Because of his intellectual and analytical approach to life, this could lead him to overanalyze situations and cause him not to step up to take bold steps or make quick decisions without sufficient proof. Now enough with all of that, let's get into when Jesus called Nathaniel to follow him. Once again, I am reading from the book of John because John is the only writer um, amongst the four writers of the gospel that goes into detail about Nathaniel's calling. In fact, he is the only one to do that. Um, so we are going to read from his version, um, his accounting of things, and I'm going to be reading the easy to read version this time. Philip found Nathaniel and told him, We have found the man that Moses wrote about in the law. The prophets wrote about him too. He is Jesus, the son of Joseph. He is from Nazareth. But Nathaniel said to Philip, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip answered, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said, This man coming is a true Israelite, one you can trust. Nathaniel asked, How do you know me? Jesus answered, I saw you when you were under the fig tree. Before Philip told you about me. Then Nathaniel said, Teacher, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said to him, Do you believe this just because I said I saw you under the fig tree? You will see much greater things than that. Then he said, Believe me when I say that you will all see heaven open. You will see angels of God going up and coming down on the sun of of man. Now, let me set the tone for you guys and give you a little background so that you can fully understand this moment here. Okay. So this is early in Jesus's ministry. John the Baptist has just claimed um, Jesus to be the Messiah, the lamb of God. And Jesus has already started calling his first disciples thus far. And don't quote me on this because we don't really know the order of which he called people but this is just you know when comparing the four gospels this is the order that i believe it went down so he already called andrew simon peter and philip and now he is collecting nathaniel let's address nathaniel's skepticism like why when he why did nathaniel question that jesus was messiah based off where jesus was from okay let's get into that okay so nathaniel was very well versed in the scriptures he knew the torah and based off this conversation that he had with philip before going to see jesus he was aware of the messianic prophecies these prophecies are listed out in the old testament if you would like to just read that whole thing yes read the whole thing to get an overview of all the prophecies that were claimed about jesus so when nathaniel heard that jesus was from nazareth and not from bethlehem or jerusalem like the prophecies specified it was hard for him to believe that this man that philip was bringing him to was the messiah i would question it too especially since during that time there were probably like and i said this before there were probably many people claiming to be the messiah and it turns out that they weren't so a lot of people were cautious Nathaniel was specifically cautious because he actually knew his word. Okay. Now, what is it about Nazareth that made Nathaniel skeptical? Now we have to do a deep dive on Nazareth. Nazareth is a small town in the region of Galilee where Jesus grew up. Archaeological evidence actually shows that Nazareth probably held about 400 to 500 people. So this was a pretty small town in today's modern standards. Nazareth's small size and lack of prominence made it largely insignificant in the eyes of many Jews that lived in Galilee, and especially the Jews who lived in Judea. Nazareth was a modest, lower class village. The people of Nazareth lived simple lives, likely relying on subsistence farming and small scale craftsmanship. The majority of people who lived in Nazareth were farmers and or carpenters, 
who worked with wood and stone. Nazareth was also not along one of the major trade routes, which just added more fuel to its obscurity. Judean Jews, and these are Jews who lived in Judea and specifically in Jerusalem, looked down upon the Galileans. As I mentioned before, they thought that the Galilean Jews were less sophisticated than they were. And this is due to the fact that the Galilean Jews were in close proximity to the Gentiles or the non-Jewish people. And they also had close proximity to non-Jewish traditions and pagan worship. Nazareth being a small and unremarkable village was even more looked down upon by the Judeans and the Galileans. Even though they shared the same cultural ideas and traditions as the Galileans, they were seen as even more insignificant due to their impoverished circumstances. The question that Nathaniel asks, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? is rooted in both regional and prejudice and the belief that the Messiah would come from a more prominent city like Bethlehem or Jerusalem. This is a good segue to bring up the religious expectations of the Messiah during the first century. The Jewish people in the first century have been living under Roman occupation and have been longing and anticipating the arrival of the Messiah. Someone who will restore Israel's kingdom, give them freedom from Roman oppression, and restore God's rule. The Messiah was expected to come from the line of David and to fulfill the prophecies of the Hebrew scriptures, which were listed in the Torah at the time. The general expectation from the Jewish people was that the Messiah would come from a more prominent um, historical location like Bethlehem, as listed in Micah, or like Jerusalem, which was the center of Jewish religion and political life. Nazareth's humble origin made it seem unlikely that the origin of the savior would be in this location. That is why Nathaniel's skepticism is kind of understandable. It was hard for people to imagine that the long anticipated Messiah would be coming from a unimportant village like Nazareth. I do want to take the time to pause and talk about um, people who come from humble origins or impoverished backgrounds. The fact that the savior of the world came from such a small impoverished town just proves that you do not need to come from a prominent location. You do not need to have a starting point of wealth or status in order to do the mighty works of God. If you are from a small town or if you come from a humble origin, as people say, humble, poor, basically, you can still be used in mighty ways by God. You are not trapped by the four walls of your circumstances. God has plans for you. You just have to trust and believe that his plans for you are for your greater good. You do not have to conform or be sheltered in the community that you in. There are other opportunities out there. And if you believe in alignment with God, you can escape from those prison walls and you can explore the world at unimaginable capacities. And I just wanted to state that period. The contrast between Nazareth's reputation and Jesus's significance serves as a reminder that God's plans defies humans assumptions about power, status, and importance. Now there are several lessons that we can learn from both Nathaniel and Jesus in this moment. Let's start with Nathaniel first. Nathaniel's skepticism about Jesus being from Nazareth wasn't out of malicious intent. It actually reflects his intellectual honesty and desire for truth. He didn't just pretend to believe something that didn't even make sense to him. But when faced with undeniable evidence, he immediately changed his view of Jesus. The lesson from this is that it is okay to have doubts as long as your heart is open to the truth. And as long as you approach those doubts with honesty, true faith often begins with questions that lead to deeper understanding. Nathaniel was initially dismissive of the idea that the Messiah would come from an ordinary place as Nazareth. Yet, when he had an encounter with Jesus and actually got to know him, he quickly acknowledged that Jesus was the son of God. Lesson from this story, we should remain open to God working in ways that challenge our expectations. Sometimes God's greatest works comes from the most unexpected places and people. Now, what else could we learn from Jesus in this moment? First off, Jesus sees us completely. Jesus demonstrated his divine knowledge of us when he told Nathaniel that he saw him under the fig tree before Philip even told Nathaniel 
about Jesus. This act shows us that Jesus not only knows us physically, but he also knows our heart and sees our intimate moments. Jesus knows us intimately and he sees our true selves, even the parts we try to keep hidden. This should encourage you to come to Jesus as you are and trust that he understands you fully. A lesson we also learn is that Jesus affirms before correcting. Rather than rebuking Nathaniel for his skepticism, Jesus first affirms Nathaniel's honesty by calling him a true Israelite, one without deceit. Jesus recognized the value of Nathaniel's character before addressing his doubts. This lesson really impacted me because Jesus meets us where we are and he acknowledges our character before he challenges us to grow. His gentle approach is the approach we should take when we address other people. We should have grace and encouragement, even when that person has doubts or shortcomings, because Jesus approaches us with grace and encouragement. And we all know that we all have doubts at times and shortcomings. Let's talk about Jesus a little bit more, okay? Because why not, all right? Jesus also has divine knowledge. When Nathaniel asked Jesus, how did he know him? Jesus says, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. This statement is mysterious and is low-key giving stalker vibes. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it indicates Jesus' supernatural ability to know people even before we meet him. The fig tree was most likely a frequent place that Nathaniel went to to pray and meditate on the word, suggesting that Jesus saw him in a private and intimate moment. The fig tree in Jewish culture represented a place of deep contemplation of scripture. It was a place of peace, reflection, and study of the Torah. Nathaniel may have frequently prayed and studied under the fig tree, showing his devotion to God. Jesus makes a promise in this moment. Jesus tells Nathaniel, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. You will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This promise foreshadows the greater revelations and miracles that Nathaniel will see as a disciple. This also alludes to Jacob's vision of the latter in Genesis chapter 28 verse 12. By connecting this vision to himself, Jesus is revealing that he is the connection between heaven and earth. He is the latter, the ultimate fulfillment of that Old Testament prophecy. For Nathaniel, who was a devout Israelite and well-versed in the Messianic prophecies, this would have been a profound revelation. But what does that mean for us today? Like I stated before, Jesus referencing himself to Jacob's vision in Genesis chapter 28, verse 12. He is just revealing that he would become the latter, the one that is connecting heaven to earth and giving us access to God. It is through him that we have access to God. If you go back to Genesis 28 and read about Jacob's vision, God promised Jacob that he would be present with Jacob until his promise has been fulfilled. The promise of God's presence in Jacob's life is fulfilled through the person of Jesus, who is God with us and continues to be with us through the Holy Spirit. God's promise to Jacob also included that all the nations would be blessed through his descendants. This ultimately points to Jesus, the descendant of Jacob through whom the whole world was blessed. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection brings salvation to all who believes and fulfills the promise of universal blessing. When Jesus tells Nathaniel, you will see greater things than this, he's promising that through faith in him, his followers will see greater works of God, both in this life and in eternity. This echoes the vision of God's activity in Jacob's vision, but it goes further. It shows how the power of God will be manifested through Jesus and his kingdom. Now, let's talk about Nathaniel's martyrdom. Yeah. Nathaniel traveled far beyond Israel to preach the gospel. There are several accountings placing him in several different locations, but I just chose the locations that were mentioned most frequently. The first location that early Christian sources states that Nathaniel traveled to was India. This was corroborated by a fourth century historian by the name of Eusebius and by Jerome, who claimed that Nathaniel took the gospel to India. It was also claimed that he left a copy of the book of Matthew in India that was translated in Hebrew. Early Christian sources 
state that Nathaniel was actually quite successful in converting many to Christianity. His work there may have been a foundational pillar for the development of Christian communities in that region, especially those that were also connected to the Apostle Thomas. Another region that Nathaniel potentially went to was Mesopotamia and Parthia. This region had a long history of Jewish communities dated back to the Babylonian exile. So Nathaniel may have found a receptive audience among this region. Early Christian writings also state that Nathaniel and Apostle Thomas worked together to establish Christian communities and converted many people. Another region was Arabia and Ethiopia. These regions were important to the center of trade, and it's possible that Nathaniel used the trade routes to reach these distant places, establishing small Christian communities along the way. It was also stated that Nathaniel traveled to Egypt and Lyconia. Egypt had a significant Jewish population in Alexandria, and early Christian missionaries often sought out these communities as potential starting points for their ministry. The final place that was associated with Nathaniel's travels was Armenia. It stated that Nathaniel was actually a pivotal role in establishing Christianity in this region. Along with Thaddeus, also known as Jude, another disciple, Nathaniel is actually considered one of the founders of the Armenian church, which became one of the earliest Christian nations. According to Armenian traditions, Nathaniel converted its king, Polymias, and his entire household to Christianity. This conversion angered the local pagan priest and set the stage for Nathaniel's eventual martyrdom. There are several traditions surrounding Nathaniel's death, but the most widely accepted and cited tradition is the one that is in Armenia. It is said that Nathaniel was flayed alive in Armenia. Nathaniel's ministry ended in Armenia when the pagan priests, angered by the large number of conversions he had made, along with the conversion of their king, Palamias, captured him. According to church tradition, Nathaniel was flayed alive, which was a gruesome punishment during that time where they would remove the skin from your body while you are still alive. After being flayed, it says that Nathaniel was either beheaded or crucified, depending on which tradition is being told. His martyrdom in Armenia is one of the most cited accounts in the early Christian history. Other accounts actually states that he was martyred in India or Mesopotamia, but the most widely accepted and cited is the tradition that he was martyred in Armenia. Overall, Nathaniel's transformation from the moment that Jesus called him to his life after Jesus' ascension is one of skepticism turned to steadfast faith. Initially, Nathaniel doubted that anything good could come from Nazareth. But after he had an encounter with Jesus, where Jesus revealed his divine nature and identity, Nathaniel immediately recognized him as the son of God. This encounter ignited a lifelong devotion, leading Nathaniel to become a tireless missionary, spreading the gospel to far-reaching places, and ultimately giving his life for his faith. Let's give this man a round of applause. Yes, he did his thing, he came, he was corrected, and he bested. That didn't sound right. Okay. And this just leads to another lesson that we can learn about God. Nathaniel's journey teaches us that God sees us fully, even in our moments of doubt, and he meets us where we are. When we are open to truth, God can transform our hearts, leading us into deeper faith and purpose. The life of Nathaniel just proves that God often defies our expectations, and he uses the humble and overlook to accomplish mighty works. Today, we can carry this message in our hearts. God knows us intimately, loves us unconditionally, and calls us to be a part of his greater story, no matter where we're from or the doubts that we may have. In the description box below will be a list of resources that I use to make these episodes. I will continually add more resources as I make more videos. And if you have resources that you would like to share with me and your community, you can leave it down in the comment section below. But make sure that these resources are factual and that you're not putting stumbling blocks in front of your brothers and sisters of Christ, okay? All right. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and that notification bell so that you don't miss out on future episodes. With that being said, why did Jesus personally seek out Philip to follow him? You can find that out by clicking on this video where I do a deep dive on Philip's calling from Jesus and his life in martyrdom. Join me next Friday at 6 a.m. Central Time, where I discuss the life and calling of James 
the greater also known as james son of zebedee with that being said my final words to you are let god do his part peace